Hi, I'm Amber, and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today, we have Bitten Johnson with us. She is a registered nurse and a sugar addiction specialist. Welcome, Bitten. Thank you, Amber. I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, she is a wealth of information, y'all. So stay tuned. We're going to be talking about sugar addiction. So Bitten, tell us some of your background. Like, how did you get to where you are now? Oh, well, um, you know, I remember starting to eat sh- sugar lumps. There were When I was young, there were not a lot of candy. There was not a lot of things that we could get. You know, I lived in the country. We ate homemade food. So, you know, candy was not on the map for me. But sugar lumps were, you know, that we had in coffee. I knew I loved them. And uh, later, you know, when I could get hold of ice cream or chocolate, you know, I love that more than anything. I've never been a, a flour lover, you know, pasta, bread, that stuff of thing has not been that interesting to me. Uh, so I knew I always loved that. And when I was a teenager, I started dieting, of course, you know, crazy diets, you know, starving diets. And the Friday evening, it all um, went down the drain with drinking chocolate milk and eating, uh, you know, whatever uh, sandwiches or not food, but you're not know, just binging on that type thing. So this was my teenage year all the time. And then when I went to nursing school, I was 19, and I heard that, you know, if you smoke, you lose appetite. So I thought that would be a beautiful dieting thing. So I started smoking, and I was a smoker right away. You know, I thought that was perfect way to, uh, you know, lose weight and all that, because I did lose weight. So I was smoking instead of eating that. And then uh, later on in nursing school, I started drinking. And I loved it immediately. I loved the effect alcohol had on me. And I I thought it was, why haven't I found out about this earlier? I'm, you know, 20 when I start drinking. So I did. And then uh, there were many years of, you know, eating. I could eat very strange. I could eat chocolate one day, eat bacon the next day, drink, smoke, you know. But I was very healthy, so I didn't have any consequences, which is bad in a way, right? Uh, and I went through nursing school and started working and, but the dieting got harder and harder. You know, it was gaining and losing more often and in a more wild manner, I would say. But when I was 33, uh, I was married to an American, lived in California, and he didn't like that I was drinking so much. So he started protesting and I started hiding and lying about my drinking to make that story short you know he forced me into treatment when i was 33 so today that is 36 well actually i was drunk the 26th of september coming into the treatment facility in california beautiful wonderful treatment i didn't like it then i hated it i thought he was nuts but anyway Uh, I came in there and 27th of september was my first sober day and that's 36 years today so I'm very grateful, very grateful, sober, <laughs> recovering That's alcoholic. Awesome. And then, but the next seven years, I was smoking, drinking coffee and, you know, uh, you know, living on my chocolate and ice cream uh, a lot, not being too interested in food and uh, gaining a little bit of weight, losing weight, you know, dieting. I was on and off like that, but I never been really overweight. So I wasn't really thinking, thinking it was a big problem. But then I met Terence Gorski, who was my mentor. He's no longer with us in this world. And uh, I listened to him and I realized that, oh my God, you know, uh, this is connected the way I'm eating, you know, because he addressed eating habits, drinking and smoking in recovering alcoholics and drug addicts. And he said that that was a risk factor for relapse. And as a nurse, I started thinking, wait a minute, how how is that fitting together? You know, uh, alcoholism is a brain disease. How can smoking, eating, you know, junk food and then drinking a lot of coffee, how can they lead to relapse? So I got very curious and I thought I need more knowledge. But one thing I did after his lecture, I went home and quit smoking. And that was very interesting, I have to tell you, because 
Then I almost drowned in chocolate and ice cream. I could not stop. I could control it so, somewhat when I was smoking. But when I quit smoking, you know, all hell broke loose. So uh, after nine months, you know, uh, quitting smoking, I'd gained more weight than ever. And that wasn't really the worst thing for me at that point. But the thing was that I was so tired. I almost, you know, killed myself in the car twice because I fell asleep driving. And, you know, I could sleep 14 hours, get out of bed and still wanting to go back to bed. I was frozen. Uh, I felt miserable. Uh, and I thought, you know, do I have Lyme's disease or because I live in the country and have dogs, right? You know, I started to come up with all these crazy explanations. But deep down inside, I knew that I did with sugar the same thing I did with alcohol. I was hiding, lying, and sneaking. You know, uh, people, people didn't see how I was eating. But when I was alone, you know, I could, you know, really live on chocolate and ice cream. It was crazy. And I, of course, I understood somewhere that that wasn't very much nourishment in that. So, you know, I could see that something was really wrong. And then I remember I was working with this American uh, counselor and she was over in Sweden training us. And I said to her, you know, what's wrong with me? I could quit alcohol. I could quit smoking. Why can't I quit chocolate and ice cream? And she looked at me and she said, maybe you're a food addict. And I said, what? Because at that time, we didn't know about the sugar. We thought food addiction was something type psychological, you know. And I knew that that wasn't the case because I didn't have any psychological problems that would drive me to eat. It was more like a physical craving. So, uh, and it was the first time I heard that word. And then I knew that there were a hospital in Chicago that was working with food addicts. So I went over there and that's how it all started. And that would be 28 years in, in October. Wow. And that was my first, you know, knowledge that, you know, food could be acting as a psychoactive drug. But there was very little research at that time. But uh, if you had the problem, you understood it. And I could relate to being an alcoholic, you know, and a nicotine addict. So that wasn't a big problem. It was more like I had to surrender to that fact, which I did. And I started to eat much better. But uh, at that time, you know, we had the food plans with grains and fruits and low fat and all that. Uh, so, you know, I still had tremendous amount of craving. But I was white knuckling it, you know, what, you know, willpower, white knuckling mm -hmm. it. But I did relapse and I felt miserable. I felt shame because I thought I know what's wrong with me and I still do it. How can I do that? And I remember one sponsor I had, and she said to me, you know, do you feel ashamed that you have been eating chocolate? And I said, are you nuts? Of course I feel shame. But, you know, it's a brain illness, she said to me, like alcoholism. And I was just floored. I never did this deep connection. So I realized that I viewed the food addiction in a, like a lighter addiction or whatever, instead of seeing it as what it is. Sugar is the gateway drug. It's because of sugar, I was an alcoholic and a nicotine addict. So I started, you know, doing what I call, I put the horse in front of the wagon instead of the other way around. And in Sweden, you know, it's very much, um, addiction is like a psychosocial problem. Uh, to me, it's a biochemical problem. It's a brain illness, a physical illness that has many severe consequences. So that's how I started to work with it. And uh, through the years, I've probably met and worked with thousands of clients. You know, I, I can't count them all, but uh, it's really a describable illness. And it is an addiction like any other addiction. And I used to say that addiction is addiction is addiction. So, uh, you know, and that's how it started for me. And through the years, you know, uh, I have tried different food uh, plants and all kinds of things. And I think it was 2005 when the low carb movement came in Sweden. 
that's when I started to uh, have less cravings, uh, you know, feel better, seeing that you could eat. Before that, the food plants were horrible, boring, uh, you know, that we were eating. They were more like, like uh, restricting and fighting, and it wasn't any joy to eat, but you, you ate it. But when the low carb movement came, you know, we started to feel we could eat really good food and enjoy it <laughs> and feel healthy and nice. But if uh, after some years, both in myself and in many of my clients, I could see a pattern that, you know, whipped cream, cheese, um, some kind of dairy with not butter and ghee, but the other products led to overeating or craving or losing it. So that's when I sort of found keto. And I've never been big into details, you know, to measuring keto or for me, keto is real food that we eat. It's not a diet or it's a lifestyle. So when I took away the milk products, so for me, it was very uh, simple. It was more like going from low carb, taking away those milk products. And then we have keto. Uh, a very, you know, uh, low carb, very low carb. And I also tried ca carnivore and, you know, I feel good on that, but I miss some of the veggies. So that's why I have a few veggies and it doesn't seem to bother me. So that's very simple. And I make food and cooking a very small part of my recovery. You know, that's maybe 10% of my recovery. I used to say that uh, food for me is fuel. You know, it's like going to the gas station and fill up the car so I can play between I fill up the car. <laughs> and I don't think about gas stations all the time or <laughs> I know when I need to fill up. Uh, uh, so I eat very simple. Um, and uh, I'm lucky where I live, you know, I can get very good food here. Uh, just nothing that is prepared, you know, from just meat, uh, protein, meat, eggs, fish, you know, I can get all of all that and the good veggies that I need and good fats, of course. And I thought it was, you put out uh, something when uh, I follow you, of course, and I, you put out something about vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll tell you one interesting thing. 20 years ago, there was a dietitian coming to one of my intensive trainings in Sweden. I think it's about 20 years ago or maybe 20 more than 20 years ago. She told me those things over at that time. And, you know, I made a slide that was saying from seed to oil and that whole process of how dangerously they are made. And I thought now it's hitting mainstream because at that mm -hmm. time when I was lecturing about that 20 years ago, I was even more than nuts than I was with not eating sugar. So the, what baffles me, and I know that you are incredible knowledgeable and you read a lot and study a lot. Isn't it amazing that we have actually known so many of these things for so many, many years, but it still mm -hmm. hasn't penetrated mainstream. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a question I like to ask you, you know, what do you think about that? Because I see the th kind of things you put out, the facts, you know, the knowledge, the science, and it's not really new for me. You package it, you, I love the way you package it, package it but it isn't new. So no. how come, where, where is it hiding? Who's hiding it? Oh, well, you know what, if you trace it back and you follow the money, that's yeah. where it's at. Yeah, it exactly. is. I'm sorry. You know, call me a conspiracy theorist. That's fine. I don't even care anymore. But it is so obvious now, you know, doing yeah. what we do and seeing what we're seeing, talking to people yes. we talk to. Yeah, it always goes back to that. I mean, yes. everything it's like, yeah. why did they vilify saturated fat and meat? Yes. I mean, meat is one of the most nutrient dense I know. foods you can possibly eat, but yet they yeah. vilified that. Why? Because they wanted to put out salt? the plant. They vilified yes. salt. Yeah. Eggs, eggs, butter, eggs, eggs butter. 
Oh yeah, butter. I mean, but if you look at it, there's not really money to be made there. The money yeah. is in the processed foods. So the here, packaging. stop eating this bad food and eat our processed packaged food that has all these seed oils and, you know, these great plant-based products that are made in a lab, uh, made in, you know, chemically altered yes. to addict yes. you to addict yeah. you. But if yeah. you, it's, it's money, it's big food, it's money. I've read books where, you know, like the big company heads, um, they got together and they, they talked about this, you know, and it's like, and you know, there's all these whistleblowers. So, you know, even if half of it is not correct, there's some truth there somewhere. You know, yeah. even if you want to discount some things and mm -hmm. I find it horrifying and it's disgusting. And it's funny you brought up seed oils because, because I had been posting, like I get a, a I, I follow so many great creators and I do a lot of reposting because I think they're fabulous and they deserve to, you know, get the uh, no, notoriety, whatever you want to call it, uh, get some yeah. notice from it. And I had somebody continually comment saying that there is absolutely zero proof that seed oils are, are not good for you. Okay. There might be studies saying that hitting yourself in the head with a hammer isn't yeah. exactly good for you, but does that mean that because there isn't, it is, I yeah. mean, who is going to fund a study to show that, you know, something that is making huge amounts of money and those companies tend to be the ones who are funding this research. You know, I, I'm sorry, call me tainted, whatever, but I've seen just so much that I, it just blows my mind. So I have a really hard time trusting anything anyway. You know, it's like, if you just look at it, if you follow the money. Yeah, but you know? we've known it for so long and it, it's like, it's keep coming up to the surface, going down in all this, you know, marketing yep. about the junk food. And it comes up again and people talk about it and it sort of disappears again. It's an amazing thing to look at from, you know, yes. all the years of, of experience I have now and the resistance I've met oh, through yeah. the years, you know. And I remember, you know, people asked me many years ago, uh, because in Sweden, there are still people that think the earth is flat, you know, the ones that <laughs> say sugar addiction isn't real. And uh, with, with all the science we have today, that's embarrassing when they say it, I must say. But anyway, so, you know, somebody asked me, how come you keep doing what you're doing when you have such resistance? This is, you know, many, some years ago. Mm -hmm. And my answer is, I know I'm right. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It does wear on you, though, after a while, you know, it's, it's like, but the, the hard thing is, is once your eyes are open, you can't yeah. close them again. No, 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 no. You know, I try no to be way. open no. and listen, you know, to, because science is always changing. Yeah. You have to kind of accept that and yeah. you may have to change your beliefs. Yeah. And, and you know, science will come around. I mean, yeah, that's science. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. God. And, and yeah. so I try to be open to that. I'm not saying I don't have my biases. I'm human. Of course I do, but yeah. I try not to, yeah. to listen yeah. to that other side because you might, have to correct yourself because new stuff has come out, just like what you said. So yeah. I'm willing to do that, but gosh, dang, when you're just but, hammered over and over again, and you know, you see, you talk to so many clients and you see it day in and day in and day in. And it's like, how can you say that's not real? How can you say that this isn't harmful? How can, you know, it's like, what do you need? What evidence do you need? <laughs> you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I just don't understand. It is very frustrating though. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we throw one starfish at a time. There you go. <laughs> and you'll, at the end, you have to talk about your starfish analogy. Cause I really love that so much. And I think, sure. you know, so many other people can be on board with that too. You don't have to be a coach or a whatever. No, 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 no. You as Not a person, just a regular person can yes, be a starfish. Absolutely. And we'll get to that at the end. Don't let me forget. Sure. Absolutely. But um, let me ask you a question here. Let, let's just kind of set a baseline so people can really fully understand where we're going with all this. What is a definition of addiction? Okay, great. Uh, loss of control, I would say, is one thing, you know. And you said something that I think is very interesting. You said, 
uh, that you had great willpower in your earlier life when you were dieting on and off, but you know you never cheated and you could easily stop, but you couldn't stay stopped. It is to stay stopped. Okay. Mm. Uh, if you can't, then you have an addiction. Uh, you hide, lie, and sneak. That's another definition. The fi- there is an of- official in the diagnosed manuals, you know, the criteria in ICD-10 and DSM-4, uh, DSM-5, I mean. I mean, you could talk about those, but there are some things that is important because people always ask me, how much did you eat? How often did you eat? They think that it is about amount and how often you eat it. It's not, it's about the brain. So um, you can eat a lot of junk food, uh, you know, often and not be addicted. And you can eat a little bit and not uh, seldom and still be addicted. It has to do with what happens in your brain. And here comes, you know, these, uh, the neuroscience, you know, takes quite a while to explain, but there is like a, a wiring in your reward center once the drug and, you know, any drug, cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and sugar. I mean, they're all the same. Once it hits your reward center, you know, and it creates a a pathway, you know, uh, the addiction is in place. So it is a chronic illness. Once that's happened, you know, that will never go away. Addiction is addiction is addiction. So it's a physical wiring type thing. And it's not caused by anything. Uh, You're not eating because of emotions or trauma or, uh, you know, things that happen to you or uh, you're not eating because of that. You have all those problems because you're eating. That is what addiction is all about. If you have what we call harmful use, you know, Uh, And and you can diagnose this today if you have harmful use or if you have addiction. So if you have harmful use, uh, you eat for a reason. You're stressed, unhappy. Uh, Your boyfriend left you. (laughs) I mean, uh, you you are happy and want to party. There's always a reason, but you're not addicted. You see Mm -hmm. the difference? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have harmful use and they can get a lot of help with their health, you know, by looking at the reason why they eat. But if you have addiction, you don't ask why, because it's an acquired primary illness in your reward center and your whole Mm -hmm. brain rebuilds. And thinking about that, you know, sugar and flour, processed food, is the first drug that you encounter. You're exposed to that when you're very, very young. So the, what should I say? The wrong wiring starts very early. So one of the reasons, you know, people don't see this picture is because they have what I call a biochemical denial. The brain is, uh, you know, not functioning properly. All the wiring is not functioning in the brain due to the drug's effect on the brain. And thinking about that, as a child, your brain is not ready-made. You know, the prefrontal cortex is not ready, for instance, where you have a lot of functions, you know, your personality and uh, many, many functions. And that means that when that gets hampered, you don't have the full effect of your brain during the time that you're addicted. And the word addiction comes from the Latin uh, addicere, which means enslaved. That's the truth. So first you take the drug and then the drug takes you. So that is, you know, basically what addiction is all about. So not everybody that eats processed food are addicted, but that's a reason that I developed this tool called sugar which is, you know, a diagnostic tool with 67 questions and where you get to know if you have harmful use or addiction. And you also get to know your whole life, uh, a chronographic curve over your whole life, how it has been affected and the consequences. Uh, And also uh, today we have a weight curve on it for the people that have weight problem. But it's important to point out that Mm -hmm. people can be underweight and be sugar addicted, normal weight and be sugar addicted and overweight. So it is not that just because, you know, that everybody that has an addiction are overweight. 
So that's very important to point out. Absolutely. And I have so often, you know, how we're talking about the naysayers, you know, that keep coming back, even though there's so much out there that that just makes so much sense, but they they keep going back. And I've heard this so much that sugar is not a drug. You can't be addicted to the sugar because it, no, it's not like drugs and alcohol, but I have had quite a few clients who have had other addictions, much, much like yourself, drugs, as well as alcohol and food addiction and call it addictive personality or whatever, but you know, it, they've had these different addictions and the hardest by far was the food addiction. They said, mm-hmm. you know, the alcohol and the drug, I'm not saying it was easy, but it was nothing compared to the, the food addiction, the sugar addiction. Exactly. That's because me being an alcoholic was much easier to quit alcohol and nicotine and sugar. And I think it is because, you know, uh, we are made to survive on sugar when we are small to grow fast. You know, it's a lot of sugar in the breast milk and so forth. But then when you start adding, you know, sugar to natural food, you make it something very different. And somebody Actually, a professor said to me, you can't be addicted to sugar. It's a natural, you know, food. And I was Mm -hmm. laughing and said, well, where do you think nicotine comes from? You know, leaves, cocaine, leaves, alcohol, seeds, and potato. I mean, do you want to know anything more? Heroin from the, you know, opium uh, flour. So... Uh, you know, the, that's just, you know, nonsense to talk about it in that way. Sugar is extremely potent, extremely potent, one of the strongest drugs ever. And there are studies done where rats get cocaine and sugar in two different groups. And then when they put them together and they got sugar and cocaine again, you know, they were both addicted to sugar and cocaine. Even the, the rats on cocaine wanted sugar. So sugar is has an incredible uh, quick effect on your brain and any drug that have a really really fast effect on your brain is highly addictive and also the fact that you have withdrawal symptoms and you cut it out proves that is it is an addiction and there are so many studies today you know i think there are about ten thousand studies on this today so uh, you know but i think you know uh, people that say that that it can't be addictive. Uh, either they have uh, shares in a sugar company, <laughs> either or they are sugar addicted and don't want to lose the drug, or they just don't understand the thing. I I agree <laughs> with you because it's out you know, there. It's, it's so obvious. It, you know, yeah. I, I don't think anyone would want to be overweight and losing weight and gaining weight and and have all the consequences or choose to have diabetes and amputate, to choose to have all the illnesses that come from sugar, nobody would ever sit down and say, well, I think I'm gonna be in diabetic. I think I'm gonna be really overweight. I think I'm gonna be really depressed, you know, or have anxiety or all the consequences that we know that you get. Nobody would choose that. So, you know, sugar gets you, it takes you. It very really fast does. and the problem with addiction mm-hmm. is that you don't see that you become addicted it becomes normal because the drug rebuilds your brain the energy in your body and your brain goes to you know supporting and defending the drug so you lose out on so many other areas in your life and you don't see that yourself so that's the problem uh, that is so true. And that's with any addiction. Like you said, an addiction is an addiction is an addiction. It yeah. really doesn't matter what the form is. Yeah. But I think that, you know, with food addiction, sugar addiction, it's in your face 24 seven, you cannot get away with it. You can't stay out of a bar. You can't uh, get away from your drug dealer friends. I mean, food is in your face. It's on the TV. It's on the radio. It's around every corner. And it's actually encouraged. And I think that makes it so it's totally much totally involved in our culture. <laughs> totally. You know, yeah. you know, you can't meet without having anything with sugar. 
have a birthday party without sugar. Mm -hmm. What do we, if we, should you and I do a, a, a cake with salami or tapas or something? <laughs> that would be fun. But I mean, most people would think we're nuts. Um, for sure. So yeah. the thing is that, first of all, it's the early exposure that is so incredibly dangerous to a child's brain that is not developed yet. So that sets you up mm. tremendously. And then it is the constant exposure because the food industry knows that there is something called cue-induced craving. That's when you see it, you hear it, and you smell it. You know, that's, because, that's why it is, you are immersed in it. You can't go anywhere. So in order to recover, and this is what we work with, you know, when we work with treatment, we are, you know, working with very special tools to help people to withstand cue-induced craving. There's also stress-induced cravings. Mm. So you have to know those two different uh, things. But we have huge toolboxes today that we can provide for people. And the problem is that a lot of sugar addicts go to people that are not trained in addiction and they get help. And that will still be, you know, a new diet or a new therapy form or another tool that's not going to help. And I used to say, if you break your leg, don't go to the gynecologist, you know? <laughs> so this is some of the things I see in society today that so many people think they can help sugar addicts. They can't. If you're not trained understanding the addict brain, mm -hmm. don't uh, work with them because you might make it only worse. You have to mm -hmm. really understand what the addicted brain is all about. Addictive thinking, you know, automatic negative thoughts, false feelings that come from the drug, which drives your behavior and your urges. If you don't understand that pattern, you can't help somebody out of this. You know, you're just going to give them like, you know, a little Band-Aid on a very dangerous wound that needs to be cleaned and, you know, uh, some really good ointment on it. So that is one of the big problems we have. And also, uh, I don't like, as a nurse, I don't like to work with guesswork. I don't like to treat you guessing what your problem is. I like to examine you and see, is this really addiction? Because I don't work with eating disorders. I don't work with people that think they have an eating disorder. And I think, well, can we look at it? Your eating disorder might be a food addiction because when food addicts starts coming up in the teenage year, they start starving. And that, that might go into anorexia, but it was a sugar addiction before. So the anorexia is a compensatory behavior to try to control mm. the food addiction. And then you lose, uh, you know, the energy to start. So you start binging and then you get the name bulimic or binge eater, but it still is a effect of the sugar addiction, you know, and then you're an overeater or a volume eater. That's the end of that story. And this is the way it goes. It starts with, you know, you loving sugar as a kid, starting to gain weight, starting to diet, restrict, binge eat, you know, purging exercising like crazy and then you have no energy left because the food saps your mitochondria it saps your energy uh, so you know and on, all the on and off so you're totally exhausted by that time so all you do is eat now you're a volume eater it's one illness called sugar addiction with all these behaviors but if somebody comes to me and i would do the sugar uh, assessment, the diagnostic tool that I told you about, and I, they have, you know, restricting or bulimic behavior or anything, but they're not addicted, I would never work with them. I don't work with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Do you see the difference in what I mean? Now? Yeah, I'm starting to understand that. And I'm not sure I really completely separated it. I mean, okay. I, I know there's like addiction and I know like there's the um, emotional, the trauma reason yes. why you eat and those are different, yeah. but I also think you can have both at the same time, you know, like one feeding the other kind yes. of thing. But you know what, you know what, sugar will help you see when did the addiction come? And in 99 out of hundred addiction comes first very early. Remember early exposure, as I told you, as a baby, 
as a small child. Okay, so addiction comes very early. And if you then experience a trauma, you can never deal with the trauma until you have healed the addiction mm. because you're putting the drug on top of it. So mm. that's why addiction has to be addressed first. You have to be drug free in order to really deal with your trauma. Right. That makes sense. Absolutely. So does it make sense then? But what oh, I'm absolutely. saying is if somebody have a trauma or have like eating disorder symptoms and they're not addicted, then they should see those specialists. But if right. those eating disorder behaviors are on top of an addiction, they are often, you know, they become addict addictions too, obsessions, addictions. So you have to address the whole addicted brain, the thinking, the feelings, the urges, the behavior. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I have a question here. Um, moderation. Number one, I freaking hate the word because I just think it's completely <laughs> worthless. Okay. There, and there are some people I have seen who can, you know, have a couple of bites and they're like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> hate those people, whatever. I'm just saying, <laughs> but I, I know they exist. Okay. But we yeah. were talking about white unicorns to me, that's a white unicorn. Um, but if somebody is addicted to food, to sugar, is it okay to moderate the drug? Absolutely not. That is actually should be, uh, you know, that's uh, should be reported as wrong uh, treatment. I find that very frustrating because if it's it way is fact earn money because the client's going to come back. Right. I, it just, it infuriates me. I see this time and time and time again on, you know, TikToks. It's like, you don't have to give up this. You don't have to give yeah. up that. All you have to do is learn to moderate. We're saying that. An addict is saying that to an addict. That's the way I feel because like you would never tell an alcoholic, oh, just a couple of glasses a night, moderate it. But see, most people, do that. And it would take too long to do that. But, uh, you know, go. that's what we teach. You know, we teach our, our clients. We don't treat them. We teach them. We educate them. And that's what I do today. I don't take any clients anymore because I train professionals to be the next starfish throwers as we're going to come to. Uh, and, and this is the thing that is so important for people to understand that you have to understand what addiction is all about deep down. You have to understand the neuroscience, you know, and that would take, you know, several hours to explain here. But I mean, we know it has to do with uh, pathways in the brain, neurotransmitters, it's not only dopamine, it's not that simple. There are others, you know, beta endorphins, serotonins, you know, adrenaline, noradrenaline and so forth. And, uh, but there's a lot of focus on dopamine, but it's not only about dopamine. Uh, I want to point that out, but it is complicated. And, uh, you know, once you understand what's happened there, you have to understand that the powerlessness is when that person gets one bite of that drug in the brain, you cannot control that. It's like it would say to you, please lift yourself in your hair or stop breathing. I mean, you can't do that. It's physical impossible. And that's what I want to point out. That's why I say that addiction is a physical brain illness. It's not a psychological problem. It's a biochemical problem. Yeah, and that makes total so sense. So moderation to me. is BS. I, I, oh God, I so agree with that. And I find it so, so frustrating because I see it all the time and people get well, darn right. Just, you know, triggered by that. Uh, what do you mean? I, I moderate. I know lots of people who moderate. That was the best thing. I can have a piece of cake and I can have this and I can have that and you know, all this. And I'm just like, okay, maybe it does work for you. Okay. I'll give you that. Maybe, you know, maybe that person really honestly wasn't addicted, but there are exactly way too think. many people yeah. out there who are, yeah. and that advice is awful. I mean, so just that's, awful. Yeah. but you know, the way we, we have to counteract that is teach about addiction. What are the symptoms of addiction? What is addiction? You know, the disease concept, the definitions, you know, like what I've been trying to do here now without being too scientific, too technical, too into detail, because then we lose people. But, you know, 
uh, deep down, every addict know that they are an addict, but they don't want to admit it. Because sure. there's one thing uh, I call the illness of addiction, the red dog, you know, and the healthy part of you is the blue dog. I love that story, you know, about the red and blue dog. And everybody can understand that uh, you are not your red dog. You do have a red dog here. So the enemy is within you, but you are not the bad person here. You have, you know, sort of infected with this nasty little thing that can be very seductive and shouldn't you have a little piece of cake or very <laughs> demanding and angry, don't threaten my drug. But once the addiction is in place, you know, uh, before, until, any, until a person that really wants help and get to listen about what this is all about, they will defend the drug tooth and nail. And uh, it's no meaning working with the person like that more than dripping some little pieces about knowledge, about addiction, about loss of control, hiding, lying, sneaking, you know, consequences, foggy brain, tired. I mean, you can do that. Uh, but uh, one day that person will be tired of their own behavior. We used to say, uh, when you come to a point when you're tired of being sick and tired, then you're ready. And then, uh, you know, what you should do is to talk to a professional to see if you are addicted or if you have harmful use. Because, uh, if, because if you have harmful use, well, go to the people working with moderation. I don't. I would never work with them. That's boring to me. So I will only work with addicts. So once I know it is addiction, I know what to do. I know how to help them out of that jungle, the pain, the loneliness, uh, the waking up in the morning and your kitchen is a, a war zone, you know, and you feel stuffed and miserable and you know that you're not going to quit today either. You're going to start, you feel miserable, but you're going to start thinking, when can I eat again? You know, that thing is driving you all the time, that part of your brain. Mm. And one day you are really in pain and really sick and tired. That's when you should call us. And I used to say that we sugar addiction specialists, we are the last house on the street. I mean, people, have, you know, they started with Weight Watchers and powders and pills and gym cards and, you know, all kinds of diets you can think of, vegan, vegetarian. I could go on and on and on. I mean, uh, powders, blah, 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 blah. Gastric bypass. You know, uh -huh. we could we could go on and on about that. Uh, but, you know, so we are the last house on the street because the red dog doesn't want you to admit that you're an addict because the red mm. dog know that then, you know, you have to give up the drug. And that's painful. That's a grief process. But that's what we are experts at helping you at. That's what we know how to do. We know how to get you out of the jungle. We have the roadmap. We have the tools you need. Uh, we have the knowledge. We have the support. Okay. So in your best guesstimate, when somebody says that, oh, I'm addicted to sugar. Yeah. What do you feel the percent of those people who say that are actually full out by your definition of addicted? Hundreds. Like, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would think hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, maybe not hundred, let's say 98 then. There are a few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are a few, but um, I think the problem is that that's been taken lightly. That mm -hmm. that's like some. Oh yeah, I'm a little bit. It, I, I'm a little bit addicted to sugar. You know, we used to I say that a lot. That's like saying, you know, well, I'm a little bit pregnant. You can't <laughs> be a little bit pregnant. That's impossible, right? You could be early in the uh, pregnancy, or you could be late in your pregnancy. You know, it's very noticeable <laughs> late in your pregnancy. And it's the same with addiction. There is three phases, actually. You know, the early phase when the battle is within you, the middle phase when it starts showing on the outside, and the third phase, you know, when it's full blown. So <clears throat> that's what it is. But uh, people, when they say it, I think many, many times, you know, and this is what I would like surroundings to listen to, that might be a cry for help a cry for help because they are trapped within this. Mm -hmm. I used to do role plays to show how that works, you know, how they have two voices in their head 
constantly arguing, you know, we should seek out, no, 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 no. We wait until after Christmas or Easter or vacation or this and the birthday party and not yet, not yet, you know, because the red dog really wants to keep the drug to, you know, anything, going to any length to do that. So when people say it, I would, you know, say, look at them and say, oh, uh, do you want me to help you to see how that looks? If you might be sugar addicted, why not? Instead of just, oh yeah, I'm a little bit sugar, sugar addicted too. You know, it's like a joke. Addiction to me is yeah. a deadly illness. It's a deadly illness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, so I, I agree with you. I for help. And I think when people say that, uh, they probably have a, a hard time with it. Since yeah. it's everywhere. It really is. And I mean, yeah. I know it, you said something like you think about something all the time. Like when I was deep into what I would say was my addiction, yeah. I would go to bed thinking of food specifically. Yeah. Let's, mm-hmm. let's get real carbs and sugar. I'd yeah. wake up in the morning. I couldn't wait to have my breakfast because I would have my oatmeal and I would have my, you know, toast and my orange Mm -hmm. juice and my whatever on, Mm -hmm. you know, my jam on a piece of toast, whatever. I I thought about that. And then as soon as I would eat that, I'd be like, Ooh, only so many more hours till my lunch. You know, I was really actually never a a snacker, believe it or not, but I thought about food food all the time. 24 yeah. seven, I'm pretty sure I dreamed about it. I mean, it was ridiculous. And that's what before when we were talking is the, the most um, awesome feeling I ever had when is when I felt like that burden released. And I no longer the food didn't control me anymore. Yeah. I was able to control the fruit. It wasn't I know controlling exactly me. what you mean. Exactly. And it's what like, you mean. that's freedom. That's freedom. The, the red dog shut up. It went into the basket and lay there and shut up, you know. So <laughs> it was back off, you know, and it goes, whoo. Okay. And the red, the blue dog takes over the healthy part of you. Yeah. And, and that, there is nothing. And people who don't experience this firsthand, they don't understand. And I'll be honest, I never understood either because out of the 40 years of the struggle that I went through doing the, the, the just the wrong things, it never released me. I was more miserable. I mean, yeah, I looked good. I, you know, I, I was healthier, but it didn't ever deal with that root problem, which was my addiction, obviously. And it wasn't until I got rid of what it was that was controlling me. Did Mm. I have that release? And, you know, people look at it as being restrictive. So if, and this is what kills me. It's if you stopped taking or doing cocaine. I'm not, I've never done drugs. I don't really know what you do with it. I snort it, whatever. If you stop doing that, you know, it's like you have this, this, you know, burst of freedom, but you're, you're not going to tell somebody, Oh, just, just have a little bit of that. You know, it's okay. But once you get rid of that, you can function again. You, you can, you have that freedom. You know, you can't go back to doing that or being around people who do that because you could easily go back to, because, because, because the addiction is always going to kind of be there if, if you feed it, you know, it's always there. It's always there, but it can be quiet or quieter. But also what I want to point out, that's why I said earlier that food is only 10%. The physical part is 10% because 40% is changing behavior and 50% of the whole treatment process is support. Like, you know, Uh you and I talking like this, it strengthens our blue dog and we share, you know, knowledge and tips and that's, you know, we read stuff, you know, I follow you on, on Instagram and I be, get reminded like about the seed oils, you know, and all that. Yeah, yeah, right. I need that, you know, because the red dog is, uh, you know, always, we say it's cunning, baffling, powerful, and very patient. Uh, and one of my favorite sayings is that it's like water around the ship. It's constantly looking for a leak. So, you know, if you're tired, uh, if you don't get your dinner, 
you know, uh, you have something very traumatic happening in your life. You, you lose your dog, like you and I have lost dogs. That's very painful. Mm-hmm. Moments like that, you know, the red dog will, you know, start to say thing coming, you know, oh, maybe I get a chance. You need to know what to do then. So I would say that a lot of people think that, you know, treating food addiction is only a changing food plan. Ha ha. That's the small part, mm-hmm. the easy part to start dealing with your biochemical repair and your food. Then the whole behavior starts, you know, and uh, we just joke and say it's really easy because all you have to do is to change everything in your life. <laughs> you have to change your behavior. You have to change your urges, your feelings and your thoughts. And in that way, you can't start analyzing this because there's nothing to analyze. You know, the more you analyze, the more you get paralyzed. And I have a, a saying there too for people, you know, that if, if you are drowning out at sea and I, th- I throw you a big cork board, you can, you know, float on that. But if you start picking it into small pieces, you know, you're going to drown. And that's what a lot of people too do. Uh, I love the saying, you know, when there is, there is two doors and there is, you know, lecture about heaven <laughs> and the road to heaven. What do you think people are? You, the lecture, because, you know, they're not ready to do the actual action changes. Mm. They want to read about it. So I don't, mm-hmm. that's true. Addict, they listen to all the podcasts, the videos, they read the books again and again, but they don't start changing. And the only way you can get out of addiction, that's to start changing behavior first. Don't think, don't, you know, analyze your feelings, just start changing behavior. Eat different tomorrow. That's how you start. Do different. Everything you do, do different. They used to joke and say, when you're going to train your brain, walk backwards through the door, change where you sit at the dinner table, brush your teeth with the opposite Mm. hand, you know, all these little things. Uh, I have a tool. It's a toy. You know, I love this little toy. Uh, because once I oh is that one of those wow, wow. neuroscientists <laughs> yeah so it's when your brain goes like this you get a shock of some kind like knowledge about addiction it goes woohoo <laughs> that's when you can do uh, new connections and neurons that wire together fire together you can't think yourself read yourself or talk yourself into recovery you have to do action do mm. different that's the tricky part. So you wish, you know, somewhere you could be kicking people's butt a little bit, do different, do different, do different. That's when recovery starts. Not, not, not the, and you, of course you have to have knowledge and education to do how am I going to change, but you need to do the change. Mm-hmm. And I think that that <laughs> it is the hard part. And you're absolutely right about that. Like, yeah. I've, I've done it myself. I, yeah. I've read so yeah, me too. many books, so oh, many God, videos. God, God. I had yeah. the knowledge, but yes. until I like mm, did it, it, yes. it you know, it, <laughs> it changed the food. Yeah. You changed the eating. It, it, it changed you started everything. eating different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's even, hard. even like a, a drug addict. Okay. They, they, they can't necessarily hang around with even the same people who no. have that issue. They have to change that, you know, alcoholics, they really shouldn't be in a bar, you know, no. it's, it's those kind of things. And sometimes that's really harsh because you're like, gosh, dang it. I enjoyed that. I want to do that. And the reality is yeah, you're probably not gonna be able to do well, that. You know, you're more sensitive in the beginning for the cue induced craving that will go away, you know? And I say like Judy, one of my favorite students that is now one of my teachers in my faculty, she said, I'm not going to eat that no matter what, you know? So you make a commitment wherever you go, mm-hmm. but I don't recommend you the first three months to go to some kind of a party where there would be a lot of sweets, you know, because they're going to jump in your head and you Mm -hmm. might go home and just binge. So there are certain situations you should avoid in the beginning, but you can actually live a much more happy, joyous and free life once you understand how this works and you do this change of behavior. And as you said, when you eat the right food, it's going to be very quiet in here. You don't have that red dog barking all the time, you know? 
So it might just say, yep, yep. <laughs> and, and then you can say, when my red dog comes around, you know, and said, oh, you know what? You've been such a good girl. Shouldn't we celebrate with blah, 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 you know, yeah. something like that. Uh, one of my favorite tools is uh, to do this. I just looked at it smiling, you know, early in my recovery, I thought, oh God, I'm going to relapse. Oh, I'm going to fight. I'm going to have to fight. I have to fight. And then I lost a lot of energy. And now I just say to my red dog, oh, hi, beauty. Are you visiting today? Uh, and, you know, yeah, maybe we should eat this and that. <laughs> or, and I said, you know what? We're not going to do it today. So you go back to sleep and we can do it tomorrow. You know, I do what I call benign manipulation, you know, and uh, because the red dog had, have manipulated me many times. So I just, you know, be very cool. Benign manipulation. I'm just being very nice. And, and then I go about my day. You know, and if it comes back tomorrow, I do the same thing. Oh, are you here? Hmm. That sounds fun. But, you know, we're not going to do it today. I don't have time today. So yeah. go back to the basket. And, and, but the, and, and, you know, like we've talked about, it feels so incredibly good to be free. Yes. That yes. Used to be, you thought was so incredibly important. I could care less because there is nothing you can put in my face that feels as good as what it feels like to be free. Honestly, truly free. I totally and, 100% agree with you. And you, you don't understand until you experience it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not it's, the first day that you're in detox. You're going to feel like that. Oh, it's yeah. not the first day and maybe not the 10th either. But, you know, we have tools for that. How to help you detox, how to support you to get to the point where you start, you know, see what does those roses smell like this? Look at the sky. Look at the fall colors. Yes. I mean, totally different. It's yes. like, you know, I used to do the, uh, uh, saying that you get sick in a way that let's say that you were in a crystal tank with crystal clear water and you know it starts leaking in a little bit of dirty water all the time you get used to that you didn't see it and then you know it was all muddy and dirty and you were in that and you thought that that was normal and then you know you start draining all the mud out of the tank and it's going to be crystal clear again and then you start thinking, oh, my God, where have I been the last 20, 30 years, you know, all my life? I haven't noticed. And you start waking up to life. And then if you take a relapse, that's like somebody throwing mud in there right away. And you're going to immediately see the difference. Oh, shoot. I don't want to feel like that. I need to go back to the drawing board, go back to the support group, talk to my counselors, you know, work it more. And that's why we work so much with relapse prevention and recovery protection, which is extremely important. Very, very, you know, very How good. do you protect this and how do you constantly be aware of risk situations, you know, like they're all around us and warning signs? And what are mm -hmm. my warning signs? You know, I hate being tired because I'm a speed, a speed freak, as you can hear when I talk and move around, you know. I like to have energy all day long like this. Nobody la, 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 la. has. Nobody has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I'm tired, I'm a little bit cranky. Oh, it's boring. Before I used to say that. Oh, it's boring. Maybe I should eat, you know. And I said, darling, you're tired. Take a break. Go and fill up with some other energy. You know, everybody mm -hmm. gets tired now and then. So, you know, you need to go and do something. Take a song. Recharge. <laughs> yeah, recharge and you know, go out in the sun or play with your dog or take a salt shot or what, you know, all kinds of different things. I have a long Absolutely. list of rechargers. And that's, that's a good point is, you know, first you got to recognize it and then you yeah. have your tools in place to, to your go-to. So you're ready to go. So you do know that you have these other options. So, and the more aware you become of this pattern, then the, the easier it is for you to be able to make those changes and to, Absolutely. you know, do something different, but you know, yeah. your fish tank uh, analogy, I, I really like that too. Um, when I, I was more in my addiction phase, if you will, to me, I think the world kind of seemed more like in shades of gray. 
it, I, it just wasn't as bright or as beautiful. But when that addiction broke, when that freedom hit, all yes. of a sudden my world had this color. I know. I, I didn't know. even know it possessed. I know exactly what you mean. I know it's exactly just... what you talk about. Yes. <laughs> yes. Isn't that amazing? It is. It is. Yeah. And it, that's yeah. why I do what I do because I want everybody to be able to experience what I did because I, I know what it feels like to basically be cuffed to that addiction. Yeah. To be controlled. Yes. Now I'm in control. Yeah. I, I all decide the consequences, all the consequences, uh -huh. you know, it, when I was detoxing and after a absolutely horrible relapse, which taught me the most of everything, you know, I, mm -hmm. so I, today I can say that I love my relapses because they really was the big, the lesson with the big L. Um, but you have to understand how you make it into a lesson instead of going hiding mm -hmm. and feeling shame. Yes. And I got that uh, knowledge, you know, how to do that. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, oh, I lost what I should say because I got interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, what I'm saying, when I detox that time, uh, I wrote down every symptom. And that's why, you know, I give people a detox list with withdrawal symptom today because you need to know what's happening to you and why. So you can stick to it, although you have all these horrible symptoms. So I wrote down every one, you know, that I felt and really have that list. So if I ever would feel tempted to have one bite, I can pull that list out and said, oh, so this is what you want to do. This is how you want to feel. Are you nuts? No, we're not going to do that. Not today, you know, and one day at a time. That's one of my favorites, you know, I can, I, I need to stick to my plan until I go to bed tonight. And tomorrow I'm going to make a new commitment that no matter what happens today, you know, I'm going to stick to my plan and I'm not going to eat junk. I'm not and going it's, to it's, one a, bite. it's a, a form of self-respect too, because, yeah. you know, you, you respect yourself enough to yeah. make these hard decisions yeah. And, and it is hard. It is hard. You do have to put in the work, but gosh, dang the, you know, the end the, result. Is and so that's hard. why, it, that's why the result, the, the support groups is so important. You have somebody like mm -hmm. you and I chatting now that you can, you can call, I would call you and said, Amber, you know what? My red dog is acting up. Would you please come over and take care of it? Would you help me to get my red dog back in the corner? Because you would understand somebody that have not, you know, doesn't know anything about addiction, doesn't believe in addiction, or still, you know, have the drug up to their ears, or what have you, they would never understand what we're talking about. So you have mm -hmm. to have the right people in your support group. That's really for sure. So that's Absolutely. very important that, you know, a blind can't lead a blind. That is so, so <laughs> true. That is so true. And, and that's, you know, I, I kind of, sort of goes back to like a drug addict, not hanging around with those druggy friends yeah, yeah, because you got to find a different set of support, set of not one that yeah. encourages no, no, no. harmful yeah. behavior, but one that helps you, you know, get to the next step. That's where Absolutely. you need to be. And sometimes you got to let it go. You got to yeah. let certain things go that may even be yeah. kind of painful. You know, it is painful. Let's get real. But sometimes you can grieve it and it. go. Sure. Yes. yes. And there is a grieving part to it. There is. I Absolutely. mean, you know, you when know, I had a treatment center, we used to take wrappers from, you know, our favorite food and go out and bury it in the ground. That's not so good because it's all, of course, you know, climate, you know, garbage things. But we used to do that. This is many years ago, but we did that. We went out and had a little ceremony where we buried it. So you can huh. do all kinds of your own. Yeah, things you can do it that. mentally. You can yes, mentally absolutely. bury it or absolutely. put it on a piece of paper and wad it up and throw yeah, it away. Burn it. I don't know. Something burn it like is that. good. Yeah. 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 Whatever. Whatever yeah. works for you. Whatever works with your, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, talking yeah. to other people that have the same problem, I think is one of the most efficient ways to keep your strength to do one day at a time. 
I absolutely agree with that. Okay, so I have a feeling. <laughs> yeah, we've been chatting a while. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm so closing in on bedtime, you know. No, I bet you. It's yeah, we have here. a little bit of yeah. a time difference here. Okay, yeah. so just really quick. Um, okay, what are the four steps to overcome sugar addiction? So, can you just briefly go over what you consider to be the four steps? I know. Obviously, the best thing would be to find an expert in this area like yourself, but for a lot of people who can't, what are some steps that they can do at least to get started, you know, at least till they can get to the point? Okay. Uh, first, I think read Food Junkies by Dr. Vera Tarman, and hopefully you can read my book when it will be translated into English. I can't well. wait. I looked I and see yeah. if, if that was yeah. an old but, you comment. Know, uh, read about that book. Join uh, like Sugar Bomb in Your Brain on Facebook, uh, my support group. We are a lot of uh, people in there that share and put knowledge and all that so that you start getting the idea that you might be addicted. You're, when we do the drug, we are immersed in the drug. When you're going to go out from it, you have to immerse yourself with education, knowledge, you know, and all the bits and pieces that is there for you to start pushing your red dog back and giving your blue dog a lot of energy and, you know, love and, and comfort and support and all that. So I think knowledge is one step to start doing it. And then, uh, you know, learn about a, a eating plan that you think would fit you, you know, but you have to take away the drug. That's number one. You cannot recover unless you take away the drug. And that's all sugar, flour, processed food. So that has to go and learn about eating natural, good food. There are so many places you can read about that out there, you know, on Instagram or Facebook or what have you. Uh, and also talk to other people how they did. Something I love to do is tell people to do solution focused, you know, like I would, you know, throw to you. How did you do it? What did you eat the first day? What did you do the second day? What did you do after that? Uh, where did you find information? How did you know how to cook this food? You know, and so on and so on. Ask people and have them tell you, this is what I did. Not tell you, you should do this. It, just telling this is how I did it. And then they pick up bits and pieces here. So you have to get around people to do that. And then be very kind and loving to yourself when you start this. And maybe you should take some dog classes is what I usually joke about how you train, you know, obnoxious dogs. No, that was a little bit of a joke, but those steps, you know, reading about it. So you start understanding if this is your problem. And of course, you know, the absolutely best way is to have the sugar uh, evaluation done by a certified and licensed professional, because then you get answer right away. And a lot of people think, you know, I can't afford treatment. I can't afford it. But, you know, I, I tell people, how much money have you spent on your addiction through the years? Mm -hmm. And then yep. they say, yeah, that's why I'm so poor today. Yeah, but maybe if you turn this around, start thinking, you know, of see if you can get some money to get some professional help to get you started, because that would be maybe the best investment you do ever in your life, you know. And, and if you, uh, once you are up there and have a lot of energy, you know, you can do everything you want in your life. So you can sort of, you know, take that back. Um, if, you, if you need to borrow money from somebody, you can get a work, you can do so many good things and pay the money back when you have the energy. It's an investment. So shall I tell my starfish story now? Yes, do we please. End? That'd be a because great I feel yeah. I'm really starting to be tired. <laughs> I was up five this morning, so it's been a long day. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an early riser. Um, and I, uh, you know, I heard this story during lecture about uh, addiction, about working as a counselor many years ago. And it, the original story is on, you can find it if you Google it, Starfish Thrower. Uh, it's about this uh, man that is walking on the beach and there is thousands of starfish that is laying on the beach and they're dying if they don't get back in the water. 
So this young woman is walking there and throwing one by one back into the sea. And he say to her, but you know, young lady, you can't save all these people. Uh, so it's not gonna make a difference. And she picks up one more and she throws it back in the ocean. And she, she says, well, it's gonna be a difference for this one. So everybody can be a proud starfish thrower. And I have to show you my beautiful mug with the starfish <laughs> on. And it says, I'm a proud starfish thrower. So we can all help each other and give knowledge and support and be starfish throwers. Amen. And that is a perfect ending because okay. we all have that. You don't have to be an influencer. You don't have to do what we do. No. Be that example, be that support, be yes. that person that makes yes. a difference in, in, yes. in some way. Yes. And, and that's powerful. So powerful. I yes. love that. Well, yes. Benton, thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you I have for having this. me. I and adore you. Meet you. Oh. Yeah, it's wonderful meeting you. And hey, I think you're here? doing a beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you. Subscribe to my channel and, and go follow Bitten too. Um, it, yes, uh, she's amazing. She's got so much great stuff out there. Um, I am, I'm thrilled to be able to have actually well, been part of the you. sugar summit with you, the quit sugar summit. Yes, I think that's pretty yes. cool. And yeah. Uh, yeah, getting to meet you. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. So I hope hey. you get some rest and thank you. I so will go to bed right away. I'm awesome. very tired. I feel that. <laughs> I bet you are. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Bitten. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.